Okay, good afternoon once again, uh, CanadianOrthodoxBroadcasting.ca here at the uh, Canadian Orthodox Monastery. And Ron Dart and I were going to talk a little bit about C.S. Lewis. And um, more, I'm going to interview uh, Ron Dart a little bit about C.S. Lewis. Uh, Ron teaches regularly at the university and uh, comes into more contact with these ideas. But uh, C.S. Lewis is uh, very much valued by certain religious groups and elements and social groups and elements because of the way he, he, in his writings, among other things, we have drama and adventure, but we always have the triumph of courage and the good and virtue. And not surprisingly, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were colleagues and actually have formed an organization together. And both of them wrote in that same vein. J.R.R. Tolkien was born Catholic and uh, 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 C.S. Lewis was, well, began as an atheist and slowly became a Christian after a while. Uh, there's a, there are a couple of things about C.S. Lewis that perhaps you could shine some light on. His use of the Tao, the idea of Tao, in it as, uh, uh, as I understand, a kind of a, a moral system or moral structure. But it's really rather odd, it seems to me, the use of this idea of the of Taoism or the Tao. Well, yeah, you, you mentioned that because he that's really the appendix to his short little book, The Abolition of Man. Mm -hmm. In The Abolition of Man, Lewis was very concerned that with the coming to be of a certain type of liberalism, morals would be so relativized mm -hmm. that no one could speak of what was right or wrong or good or better or best or bad, worst, worse. And um, what was happening at Oxford, Cambridge, and uh, on the continent at the time and other places was the dimming of any sort of ethical standards. And um, The Abolition of Man, which is interesting, a book I talked to Sheila Grant um, a few years ago before she died, and um, George Grant died in 1988. George and Sheila were at Oxford at the time that The Abolition of Man came out. Lewis, and they were both very involved in the Socratic Club. And, what Lewis was doing in the Abolition of Man in the appendix called the Tao, he said, on the one hand, we have this increasing fraying of ethics, in which no one will be able to stand on their feet anymore and say, this is right, this is wrong, or this is good, or this is better, or this is best. In the appendix, he says, let's track all the great civilizations of the past and see if there's a sense of uh, an ethical standard by which they all concur and agree to. And so he goes into Egyptian civilization, and Indian civilization, and Chinese civilization, the Tao. And it, as he goes through each of these great religious, ethical systems, he takes the position that all the sacred civilizations of the past held that there is a standard, and to the degree we know that standard and attune ourselves to that standard, we are truly free to live a good life. And so for what Lewis was doing, the Tao for him was really just an use of an Asian word to articulate the Western understanding of natural law. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's something uh, that we all share in common as opposed to those who would say we share nothing in common and that standards are purely private and individual and no one can legislate right from wrong, it's purely relative. So I think what he's doing with the Tao, it's a, it's a reply to the fragmentation of ethics in the modern mm -hmm. We could say also in the postmodern world with him within Cambridge and Oxford at the time. Yeah, I think sometimes when I look at C.S. Lewis, I also think of Hobbes' Leviathan and think that often I think Hobbes is a little bit misunderstood. I, I don't think he should be placed in, uh, uh, on the dark side with John Calvin and, and others because in the Leviathan, uh, Hobbes is talking about something similar that you have to have an organizing authority that brings together the disparate uh, interests and gives some kind of some kind of possibility of, um, of some kind of civilized and peaceful intercourse among people, some some what we would call nationhood, <coughs> where, where people are somehow cooperating where they wouldn't be otherwise. But that this Leviathan is the organizing authority over it, and it seems to me that C.S. Lewis saw something of the necessity 
a, a spiritual organizing force more than a politically organizing force. Yeah, Lewis would argue unless there's not some commonality that you share that has been given to us mm. from the great classical tradition and through other great civilizations, sacred civilizations, mm. then what you're, you're into what Yeats called the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Yeah. And so Lewis is very interesting in that most who just know Lewis superficially would have been exposed to him through Chronicles of Narnia, the children's story, or as an apologist through the BBC, uh, Mere Christianity. But Lewis was essentially a, a, a medieval, a Renaissance scholar. He saw the beginning of the end of Christendom uh, with the coming to be of the Reformation, which he tended to see as the deformation mm -hmm. of Christianity. And, um, and so um, what's happened though since the late 1950s is uh, some leading thinkers from Wheaton College, which is somewhat called the Vatican of the Evangelicals, mm -hmm. got very interested in C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Clyde Kilby and there were others, and they began to bring a lot of the archives to the United States. Mm -hmm. Lewis, um, Dorothy Sayers, uh, Charles Williams, Tolkien, all of this group. And so Americans came to think that, oh, if Lewis's works and all this group at Wheaton, Lewis must have been an evangelical, mm -hmm. which of course he was the farthest thing in the world from an evangelical or even a Calvinist. He saw these as, as, as serious um, distortions of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But Lewis in North America has come to be seen as a, um, really um, an apologist for the Reformed and Evangelical world, where some of his greatest writings uh, defend the classical tradition you know, whether it's 16th century literature, excluding drama, the discarded image, you go on and on with these works. And so, uh, and this I think which makes Lewis uh, particularly interesting to many of the Orthodox, because mm -hmm. they both, Lewis was dipping his bucket in a deep sub, subterranean stream of the Fathers, mm -hmm. and of course the Orthodox tradition is, is grounded in the Fathers. So would you see that as some of the areas well, of the that, that is why, uh, Orthodox Christian, actually, to a lot of Orthodox people. And one thing is that when, when one goes beyond his uh, more popular writings, I mean, more popular writings can be, okay, a good image like triumphs and uh, courage has, has held it, uh, given a high value. But the other thing about uh, Lewis that uh, strikes me is his interest in virtue uh, as part of the educational system, an education toward virtue something that, that's almost completely missing in modern education. And by <clears throat> perhaps a misunderstanding of virtue is thinking, you know, people running around with chastity belts on or something. But, but uh, virtue, or uh, the, uh, the perfecting of, of one's ability, skills, and talents in a positive rather than negative way, and, uh, and the, which is the, the real being of virtue. And uh, he, he really was concerned that that should be an integral part of the educational system and, and of, of the way you bring up people with that idea of, of, of virtue as a goal, as something that one worked toward. Yeah, and Arete, we just get a word aristocracy, mm -hmm. the rule of the noble people who are willing to, and a lot of his more popular works mm -hmm. are in fact, is how do we overcome our false self, our false face, mm -hmm. Uh, through struggle with grace, mm -hmm. which in Orthodox or uh, Catholic Anglicanism, which Lewis was, synergism, uh, how, how do we participate with God in becoming who we're meant to be? And they are, those are aristocrats of the soul, mm -hmm. or aristocrats of virtue, and the notion that, um, at our noblest, to the degree we're willing to let go of what we are not, to become what we're meant to be, uh, that's what an aristocrat, a spiritual well, aristocrat supposedly. is. Uh, and perhaps once upon a time. <laughs> but it, that, that is the whole thing. I think the misunderstanding of what virtue is might be a little bit of a, a part of a problem because what what is the virtue that we're striving toward as human beings is not just to maintain a moral code or a moral law or be good, gooder than most, <laughs> but to be the best that a human being can be. Not say, the best that I can be, but the best that a human being can become. That uh, this is my my advancement in, in, toward toward perfection, which is what God has called us toward. My advancement toward perfection is 
in behalf of the whole of, the, of, of humanity, the whole of the human race. That is not to make myself better than others, but to fulfill, the, really, the fulfillment of the actual calling of the human being, of the actual um, possibilities as a human being. That uh, would, would be more, I, in, in any case, I see that as a kind of virtue that C.S. Lewis would call people. Yeah, and I think what's happened is the language of the virtues and vices have been co-opted by periodism, and so they become ethical codes, yeah. whereas arete and the classical virtues and vices are about knowing yourself, uh, knowing your nature in that classical sense of phusis, and perfection, even the language of, uh, you know, when, when Christ says, be perfect, um, it's, it's, it, the word there is, is um, the word that, do you know yourself and are you living out of who you're meant to be in the deepest sense of the world? And all sin is, hamartia, is missing the mark of who you're meant to be as a human being. So it's an ontological, an ontological term, not ethics in a lower level. It's more about are you becoming who you're meant to be at the most significant and deeper level. And if you're not, that's what sin is. It's not misdeeds and misdemeanors in a Puritan sense. Yeah, well, I, I, I wonder... And perhaps you'd know, certainly, better than I would, whether or not actually had to come up against this, this idea that the problem of the concept of morality and ethics has perhaps a roadblock toward virtue, uh, in, in, in the way of virtue itself, that we have a static system of, of, of rules that when we fulfill that, that was fine, but not necessarily rising beyond that where those things weren't even necessary themselves, because that was toward the perfection of mankind, was that we surpassed concepts of, of, of morality and ethics and went to something higher. Well, this is where, <clears throat> as we mentioned in the conversation, we started with the abolition of man. Lewis was very wary on one hand of the relativizing yeah. of ethics. On the other hand, he was very worried of the Puritans mm -hmm. who wanted to reduce ethics to a moral code. Yeah. So this via media, or this middle way, was what the, the virtues, or arete, or know your nature, was all about. And in all of Lewis's writings, both his academic writings and his more popular uh, works of fiction, he's constantly exploring this meaning of aristocracy of the soul, what the difference between virtue and vice is in terms of our being and who we're meant to become. And so, yes, yeah, so be wary of Puritanism, which emerges with the 16th century, on the one hand, and be wary of relativism on the other. And between Puritanism and relativism, there's the great vision of who we are by nature and how we come to know ourselves and how often we forget who we are yeah. because of a whole range of internalized or external expectations. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me uh, that Puritanism breeds relativism because Puritanism is building a fence and a wall around something and it's within our context. Okay, once this is within your context, then this can be within my context. And we're not trying to search out what the ultimate destination or goal is. We're trying to preserve a, some, a system that's relative to us as Puritans. But then people who are not Puritans well, okay, but relative to us. <laughs> and, and in a way, that kind of freezing something, the way the Puritans have said. Yeah, the only way you can actually deal with it is in a relativistic way. Yeah. <clears throat> because relativism is a reaction to Puritanism yeah. in many ways, just as Puritanism is a reaction to relativism. Yeah. And there is a, is a much more substantive middle way yeah. of, of understanding virtues, nobility. And this is what Lewis and many of the great um, you know, theologians of faith are grappling with, but you get this lesser debate between, between um, relativism and Puritanism, mm -hmm. which uh, the, the, the great women and men who have thought these are trying to raise the discussion to a yeah. more substantive and meaningful level. Yeah, yeah and there were authors, like Lewis, and, and, uh, and a gentle kind as well, who are actually through the things they're writing trying to explore these ideas of... Um, of, of discovering yourself and discovering who you are and discovering. And I, I even in Albert Camus, uh, the one thing that strikes me in the, the plague, I don't know if you read the plague, uh, it's in this catastrophe of the plague that little by little these individuals discover a meaning to life that's beyond themselves and that, it, that involves other people. And really, the, in, in the plague, it's, it's really about discovering that 
as a human being, by actually becoming more virtuous, by taking responsibility and by discovering my, what my relationship with other human beings is. And I mean, I, I, Camille wouldn't have been exploring that from earlier. It just wanted you, of course. But, but it, it, there's a great deal to be said for that, uh, uh, as these various people in the, in the plague in the city are discovering something beyond themselves. And they're, they're coming to have a greater value through their relationship and their response to other people, and in many cases, other people suffering. And uh, that, that this is a kind of uh, discovery, of beginning of the discovery of what virtue actually really is, is coming to, to, to the fulfillment of, of what our humanity is really all about, as, yeah. as humanity. It's interesting, too, you mentioned Tolkien and Lewis and Tolkien mm -hmm. were a group called the Inklings, and in a couple of weeks, Tolkien's The Hobbit is hitting the theater mm -hmm. December 14th. Very interesting, in The Hobbit, one of the uh, key figures in the, the Hobbit, anyway, is um, Bilbo Baggins, who mm -hmm. lives in the Shire. And he has two family backgrounds. The Baggins, which are all about security and protecting himself and not taking chances and risks. And the Turkish side of the family, which was about risk and adventure. Mm -hmm. And are you willing to leave behind the comfort, the predictable, the secure, mm -hmm. to go out into something that you're not sure about, which would be the faith journey. And, um, to go and there and back again. There and back again. <laughs> and so really, when, when you think of this being, non-being, or virtue, most people are always torn inside. Are they going to give themselves to security, predictability, comfort, or will they be open to adventure, risk, challenge? And it's a, it says the wizard Gandalf comes and knocks on the door, and the dwarves start coming in. That Bilbo has to make a choice. Will he... Will he capitulate to the secure and predictable, or will he go on the great journey there and back again? And that's very much a story that Tolkien is exploring uh, about nobility of character or shrinking character. Yeah, even, even I mean, in, in, in the most case, there's a lot of physical adventure, but there's also mental, emotional adventure that we should open ourselves up to. And that's part of what the decision that Baggins has to take. First, first of all, first of all, is to be open to the other, and to be open to the possibility that there's something beyond what he, he's experienced and knows. And that's emotional and mental, philosophical as well as physical adventure. Most of the Hobbits really, it's really about how an external event challenges us internally and how we respond internally to the external challenge. And it's interesting, much of the Hobbit, um, Bilbo is put with dwarves who he just does not get along with, and he has to somehow stay with them. And so the wizard, in, in terms of Bilbo's own transformation, or in, uh, you know, Christian tradition's deification in that sense, is about being put in the company of people who he's constantly irritated by, who ignore him, who treat him indifferently, who badmouth him, who caricature him, and yet they have to go find the gold, and somehow he has to stay with the dwarves, yeah. even though the dwarves have problems with him and he with them. Yeah, and they work it out. But this is um, th th this is uh, part in, in, uh, uh, trying to find out what the prevent. First of all, what is the vocation of our humanity? And uh, it, it seems to be these, these particular writers are trying to explore what the vocation of our humanity, but then also trying to rise to, to that vocation is, is the process of virtue as well. And of course our concept of that is through Christ. Other people have a different concept of it, but nevertheless trying to find the real vocation of humanity and what, what it is to be human, an actual human being, as opposed to being uh, just a, uh, a gorilla with vocal cords, you know. It's uh, 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 that's that's part of our part of what Lewis is, in, in my view, anyway, understanding. Yeah. Part of what Lewis is exploring. Yeah, and Lewis and, uh, stood very, very much within that great Christian humanist tradition, you know, that brought together the wisest and the most insightful and the best that had been articulated both in the. Western tradition uh, and also in the great religions of the world mm -hmm. and he was involved in his different way in, in synthesizing these in his work against what he saw as the fragmentary nature of the modern world yeah. which was dissolving any 
any uh, standard or center or core that could hold us together. So he was very prophetic, like he saw, he saw where the West was going, and he tried to articulate an alternate way through his academic works, through his popular writings, through his fiction, through his science fiction, a whole range of different genres he used to, to, to raise the question, what does it mean to live a meaningful, noble life? The same things Camus is exploring, but obviously within a, a Christian context. It's been a framework, but nevertheless, nevertheless, you know, you couldn't really, I mean, Camus had an idea which was, had a certain universality to it, particularly in that, yeah. in that particular novel. And I, I can see the same kind of basic idea in, in uh, Lewis as well that what is the vocation of my humanity ultimately? And it can be, until you take responsibility for what your vocation is, you're a non-person. And uh, in, in uh, C.S. Lewis too, it's, this is the ascent in virtue, is taking responsibility for the vocation of your vocation of, as a human being, the vocation of humanity itself. And so these ideas, and I think Lewis had to grasp that these ideas had a universality to them because all human beings, all societies, all cultures are grappling with human problems. And humans are basically the same. We have the same human nature. So naturally we came to some of the same conclusions or similar conclusions. And there is a kind of universality in those approaches to the human condition in it. And they, they cross many boundaries. But the loss of these concepts is something that really then devalues our, our humanity or devalues our uh, calling as human beings, devalues our vocation of humanity. Yeah, and, and what? I mean, I think the comparisons you're making are very good in that both Camus and Lewis come out of a humanist tradition mm -hmm. at its best. Obviously, in Camus, you get uh, more a bit of the dimming of the religious, mm -hmm. whereas in Lewis, it's 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 very explicit. And and Camus is known as one of the great existentialists, right? As an existentialist, just means existere. You step out into who you're meant to be. You yeah. take responsibility for who you're meant to be. And in that sense, both Lewis and Camus are existentialist humanists. Mm -hmm. Lewis is, is 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 more explicit in his in his uh, commitment to the Christian tradition, but he has a breadth about him that Camus also had, and, and a commitment to life, because Camus entered the big struggles mm -hmm. of his time with France and Algeria, and his yeah, large right. issues, his novels, as you mentioned. And losing one of his lungs to tuberculosis is yeah. this at all. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I sometimes think we, we push aside, say somebody was told, oh, Camus was an atheist, you can't read him, and, um, uh, C.S. Lewis was a Christian, so I can read him. However, we're missing a whole dimension of the human formation that way, because both of them, in a way, are, are looking towards something. And we would assert that the Gospels maybe have the answers that Camus was looking for as well. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, uh, but nevertheless, it, he's, what he's expressing is that this is part of the human condition, is trying to find out what it means to be human, what it means to have a, the, the, uh, this vocation of humanity. It seems to me that Camus is interested in that as Lewis is, only from different aspects. Yeah, and I would prefer a Camus who is non-religious, but is really trying to grapple with these deep human issues where there's suffering and tragedy, than someone who claims to be religious but is not engaged in the big issues of life. Because one uses the language of religion as a form of escapism, mm -hmm. and the someone like Camus or Marx or these others, they're reacting to the distortion of religion, and there's a health mm -hmm. in their reaction. Now you want to take them further yeah. down the path, but you want to say your reaction to this this shallow, domesticated, sanitized religion is simply not healthy, and to fight against it's a sign of health. Now good thinkers like a Lewis and many others are saying. Good for you people who react to shallow religion, but there's more to religion than the shallowness you're reacting to. Well, in, 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 yeah, uh, mere religion. <laughs> so, but part of what I was getting at, of course, oh yeah, yes, yes, I say the Lord's Prayer and I, uh, I acknowledge the uh, symbol of faith, 
Doesn't mean I try to live it, but I acknowledge it, you know, so I'm a Christian. And uh, Lewis was calling on us to go a great deal beyond that. And Camus was looking for that path also. And uh, perhaps, you know, sometimes we could offer it uh, if we would. <laughs> That's well, it's interesting, he, he concludes the last battle, which is the seventh book of Chronicles of Narnia, that there were some in the last battle who didn't acknowledge Aslan, but they didn't explicitly, but implicitly in their lives and fighting for the good, mm. they were Aslan's people. Yeah. And so the last battle concludes with these big questions of some who claimed to be following Aslan didn't in the last battle, some who didn't know Aslan but fought for the good were closer to Aslan. Mm -hmm. This is what... Uh, the ones were actually his followers. That's right. And of course, uh, sometimes uh, there are non-Christians who follow an example of Christ who come far closer to Christ than some Christians do. Oh, absolutely. As well, yes. and we need to acknowledge that. So, here our time is up, and we thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we'll uh, continue uh, discussions of uh, Ron and I do these broadcasts regularly, and we hope you'll join us in future for these broadcasts. And uh, thank you all, and God bless you.